Hey guys, thank you for having me, man. It's just a, an incredible privilege just to stand before you yet again. I think it's just over a year since I was here. Lost, you're going to be getting sick of me, but uh, I'm like a bad smell. I just keep coming back, you know. <laughs> but uh, it's really just so, such a privilege, and I thank you really for, for hosting us so graciously. But uh, also, just uh, last time I was here, um, I stood on this stage, and you guys very graciously and kindly presented us at our ministry project, Genesis, with a beautiful, generous gift. And uh, we have utilized that gift that you've given to us and the partnership that we have with you, which is not just me coming here, but it's your gracious contribution to our work. Uh, we've been utilizing that in what we call our Safe Place Project, which is one of the projects that comes out of our Genesis uh, group of projects. And it seeks to address the needs of, of people in crisis. And in our country, there are certainly plenty of those. And in the community near our church, we suffer with incredible poverty and, and injustice and crime and, and poverty and all those, those social ills that follow in the wake of pandemics like HIV. And so we as a church have sought through Genesis to do stuff. And you guys have been so gracious in helping us. We, we, have a, we call it the Vacky Safe Place. And that's the one that you guys have sponsored. And we're so grateful. This, this, this safe place, I wish you could just spend a night there. Or maybe, I don't wish that you could spend a night there. But uh, it's just so well utilized. There are a lot of people coming there, getting protection. Children coming in to be protected. Wives that have suffered gender-based violence. Teenagers that have been sexually molested. It's just the most amazing, amazing place. So from all of us there in Africa, specifically the beneficiaries of your kindness, we say thank you, Vaki, for what you're doing. Thanks, Sean, for the partnership that we've had. Thanks, Ripley, for being who you are. And uh, we're just so grateful for all that you are to us. So God bless you as you continue. Today I have a message that I would like to share with you. And it comes from the Old Testament. And you know, when you talk Old Testament stuff, you generally paint in, in broad strokes. New Testament stuff, you take things apart and you put them back together again, and, and they call it sort of exegetical preaching. But uh, Old Testament is a little bit broader. It's still exegetical by nature, but it, it's broad strokes. But every now and then, you find a particular passage that is intriguing because of the amount of detail that there is in it. This is not broad stroke stuff, the passage I want to take you to. There's lots of broad stroke stuff around it, but this particular passage is noted by the amount of detail that there is in this particular story. And you'll find in the book of 2 Kings, and I'm going to go from verse, uh, chapter 6 from verse 24 through to the end of chapter 7, but I'm not going to read the passage to you, it's too long, and some of the detail in there is a little, little horrifying. And I don't think we should maybe read that if there are children's ears around. But I would encourage you to go home and to read this particular passage. But there is just one verse that I want to pick out for you in a moment. And we're going to focus in that. But in order to get that one verse right, you've got to understand the whole context of what we're talking about today. The prophet Elisha, one of my favorite characters, known for his incredible uh, ability to do miracles and other than Jesus, Elisha did more miracles than any other person recorded. And he is in his miracle mode. But it's not always popular to be a prophet. And uh, in this particular passage, we're going to start off by talking about the situation. And I want to talk to you about just you know, the, the context of where the story was. At this particular time in the history and with Elisha, the nation of Israel was in crisis once again. They found themselves in a town called Samaria, and uh, they had been surrounded by Benadad's army, and he was out to get them. He sieged the place. He stopped food coming in and food going out. He stopped water. He just, he just sieged everything, so there was nothing good happening in Samaria at this time. And the siege had intensified to the point where the famine and the degree of degradation of humanity was just horrific. You could go and you can read that if you have the nerve to do so. But in the midst of all of this crisis in the town, amidst all the famine 
and all of the horrible things that were going on, Elisha was there. And, ben, and the, the king of Israel was obviously, he was just like us. And when things go wrong, you know what the first thing we do is we, we try and find somebody to blame. We try and pass the ball to somebody else and say, it's because of him. Well, the king was walking on the wall one day, it says there, and he heard a conversation taking place between two women. And the conversation was not a pretty one. And uh, his heart broke when he heard the conversation between these two ladies. And he got angry with what he heard. And he said, it's that man, Elisha. Wherever he goes, he brings trouble. Wherever El Elisha is, there's some horrible consequence that follows. We need to get rid of Elisha. So he calls his soldiers and he says, go and get him and kill him. And so they're on their journey to find Elisha. Word gets to Elisha that the king's men are coming to get you. So Elisha just closes the door and he has a conversation with the king through a closed door. And the king is ranting at him, rant because of you that this poverty is because of you that all this famine and this horrible stuff is happening. Elisha, you to blame it. We're going to get you for that. And Elisha just calmly says, hey, king, listen carefully. By this time tomorrow, there'll be no more poverty in this place. By this time tomorrow, freely you'll be able to have food. By this time tomorrow, there'll be flour, there'll be barley, and you'll be able to get it for next to nothing. Whereas now you pay the earth just for a, a little bit of something. Tomorrow, it's going to be all over. <laughs> and the king says, you're right. You're right. And so the situation was a really tragic, tragic one. And then Elisha continues his prophecy. He says, hey, king, by tomorrow evening, this will all be over. There'll be plenty of food in the place. Your people have lots to eat. But you, king, you, king, are going to see it but you're never going to eat it. You're never going to eat of it. And he closes up the conversation with that. You say, well, what's that got to do with us? I think it has everything to do with us. Because the parallel is, is quite clear, is it not? The parallel is quite clear that as much as their need was a physical need of hunger and starvation and desire for something better and a better life, so too it's a picture of our spiritual need. You do know, people, it's Mission Sunday. And my job today is to remind you that the world out there is hungry for the stuff that you have. They're hungry for the gospel of Christ that we sometimes hold to ourselves. They're hungry for kindness, they're hungry for goodness that the church has to offer to them and we should be sharing with them. In the passage, as it continues, you'll see how the next aspect of it is. We've spoken about the situation. Let's talk about the salvation of that situation. Here's what it looked like. Outside of the city wall, there was a, a group of people, four of them. They were all lepers. They lived outside the city wall because they weren't allowed to live in the city wall because of this dreaded disease. So they put them on the outside. So there they were on the outside of the wall of the city. And around them was the, the army of the Aramans. These were the ones who were sieging them. And these four lepers sat there every day. They were hungry. They were starving. They were angry. They were dissatisfied. They were suffering because of the injustice of, of what had happened to them and the response of the people toward their need. And they were outside the city wall. The four had a meeting. They called a meeting and they said, guys, we're going to make some decisions here. You know, we're going to die. You do know that. The choice of death, we've got to choose our poison today. You know, should we, should we go into the city and they'll kill us or starve us to death like we are right now? Or should we just get it over quickly? Why don't we just walk into the army of the Aramans and just maybe they'll be kind to us. It's unlikely, but we've got a choice. Do we want to die here or do we want to go to the Aramans and let them kill us quickly? They decided the Aramans was the way to go. So they went and they went into the place where the Aramans were. And to their surprise, they found the most incredible thing. Hey ho, nobody's home. The place is abandoned. The Aramans, not an Araman in sight, but they've left everything there. The food, the clothing, the silver, and the gold was all there, ready for the taking. And they couldn't believe it. They didn't need a second invitation. They got stuck into gorging themselves with their food, and they found clothes that fitted, and they checked themselves out, and they put the clothes they wanted. They found silver. They found gold. They hid it 
so that no one could take it from them. And then with a pang of conscience, the men said this. They said, hey guys, we are not doing what is right. We need to share the good news. This is verse 9. That's our key verse. We're not doing what is right. We need to share the good news with the people in the city. Now, that was a brave decision. After what the people in the city had done to them, they had to make a, a really huge decision right now. Why on earth, why on earth would we want to share with them? They have trashed us. They have caused us to suffer. They haven't fed us. We, we, we shouldn't be sharing with them. But the pang of conscience was so deep that they decided they would go back to the city and break the news to them. The city were overjoyed. They did do a bit of a test, checked it out. They found it to be true. And then the prophecy came true that as they were, as they were telling the people about what had happened and the message went out that there's food outside the city, go and plunder the place of the Aramans. They've gone. God had sent a noise that night and they'd scarpered, they'd run. They'd hidden themselves, the army, and now there was no one there. And they plowed their way out of the gate of the city, and they trampled all over the king's messenger. And so the king's messenger, who represented the king, he saw, but he did not eat of that which was provided outside the city wall. Elisha's prophecy came true to the absolute letter. But this word haunts me. We're not doing what is right. You see, they weren't doing what was wrong. It's just that they weren't doing what is, is right. And so they decided they would go back and they would tell the people what had taken place and they could go and get their food. Now, if we have a look at this passage, we've spoken about the situation. We spoke about the salvation that came in the most unusual way which salvation often comes through. God uses agents of redemption in the craziest way. Who would have thought that God would come with a plan of sending his own son to redeem mankind? That redemption and salvation would come through the son of God. That's a crazy plan that God would be willing to sacrifice his son so that we could have salvation. God continually surprises us with the agents of redemption. Here's another case. Four lepers are used as God's agent of redemption for salvation, for physical salvation for all the people there. But this agent of salvation is a crazy thing. Because we all think, people, that salvation comes prior, or sorry, salvation comes after sin. We sin, we ask God to forgive and we receive salvation. But the intriguing thing in the third S that I want to talk about is the S of the sin. We've spoken about the situation. We've spoken about the salvation. But let's talk about the sin thing, first of all. It's not the sin of commission, is it? What is the sin of? Omission. Right on. It's the sin of omission. They weren't doing what was right. They weren't doing anything that was wrong. They just weren't doing that which was right. That's the sin of omission. And the sins of omission come after you have got right with God. Prior to getting right with God, the sin of omission is, 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 is not a, anything to you. It's there, the sin of commission. But the moment you receive salvation, the big test comes in not what you did, but what you're now going to do. And the sins of omission of what this is all about. We're not doing what is right. Now, you say, well, if that's the case, tell us what to do so that we don't fall into the trap of, of sins of omission, of the things that we should be doing right. Well, they're not difficult. First thing he tells us is we have to tell good news. We've received this. We've got all this great food. We've got all this stuff. We've got all the plunder. We need to tell good news. That's the first thing. The second thing that we learned from the passage is not only do we tell good news, but we've now got to be good news. We've got to share all this stuff. So we tell good news about, hey guys, there's food out here. It does actually, we, we feel kind of ownership toward it, but we feel responsible that we need to share it with you and we need to give you not just our story, but we need to give you our stuff as well. And that's the challenge of these four lepers that we read in our story today. Now, in order for us 
to be able to understand this. The news flash to you all is because these lepers had fallen into the trap to think that this is our stuff. You do know that you own nothing, hey? Nothing. It's God's. We think, well, I've just got to give God my tithe and the rest belongs to me. Rubbish. We, we, who told you that? God owns it all. And whatever he has given to you has come from his good hand. We sang just, oh, the goodness of God. He's just, his goodness is overwhelmed. It's running over. We sang that just now. Indeed it is. And God says, I have given you that. It's actually mine for you to use the way that I've told you to use it. So get over yourselves when you think, well, I've earned this. This is my stuff. It's not yours at all. God has given it to you, all of it, to be used for his glory. Now, your story is a very powerful thing. You know why? Because it's your story. No one can argue with it. And when you share your story with people around, it's not like you need to go to Bible college for five years and get a degree in theology. You just got to share your story. And so these four lepers are saying, we have good news for the people in the city. We need to go and tell our story to them, which they then, thank goodness, did. Now the problem is, as I said, is that by human nature, we don't like to share stuff. We don't even like to share our story sometimes, never mind share our stuff. But we have, to, we have this thing that when we're born, have you noticed, we're born with a selfish nature. Every kid that's ever been born, the first thing he does or she does is cry because they want stuff. Feed me. <laughs> they, want, they want stuff. And if you don't give them the stuff fast enough, what do they do? They just continue crying because they are selfish. They want what they want and they want it now. And so you moms and you dads, you have to feed your kids. You've got to run around. And when that baby cries, you drop everything because the baby has a need. The baby lets you know he has a need because he's very selfish. He's not waiting to say, okay, mom, when you get back from the shops, mom, you can do my food then. That'll be cool. That'll be cool. That'll be... He never does that, does he? He just screams at blue murder because he wants, he wants it now. And we're born with this selfish nature that it's mine and you owe it to me. Don't touch it. It's mine. But at the same time as God has created us like that, God has also put something inside of us called a conscience. And in good conscience, sometimes we think, man, I really need to do better with the stuff that God has given me. I need to do better with my story. I need to be do better with my stuff. And our consciences should be saying that the tragedy is many of us have seared consciences. That little voice, Everybody has it. Don't believers have it. The Holy Spirit can use your conscience to activate greater activity, but everybody has a conscience. But if you ignore something long enough that it gets calluses on your mind and your memory and your eyes, and you can't see it because you can't feel pain anymore. You know, it talks about a seared conscience in the New Testament. Paul talks about that. And a seared conscience is like a person with leprosy. They can't feel pain because the nerve endings are dead. And if you don't respond to what God is saying, every time you don't respond, the nerve endings die, die, and die, and die, until you can't feel pain any longer. Isn't it like that in life? We hear the voice saying, you need to do better with what you've got. We don't do it, and every time we do it, our calluses get thicker, and the scotomas on our eyes get, get bigger, and we can't feel pain anymore. So you say, well, what happens now? Well, you've got to battle this thing. You've got to battle this thing about selfishness. You've got to recognize it for what it is. Because selfishness leads to indifference. And indifference, according to Patch Adams, is the greatest disease of the soul. Have you heard that before? It's the greatest disease of the soul. It's not hatred. It's not anger. It's indifference. That's why we have this beautiful picture in Scripture of coming down of condescension. You have a look at Moses in Exodus chapter 3, and I was talking about this to some kids in Norway recently, and uh, we were talking about the commission at the, at the burning bush where God met Moses at the bush, the bush is on fire, and God says to Moses, Moses, listen carefully. I have seen the plight of my children. I have heard the cry from my children, and I am concerned with what's going on with my children of Israel. I have now 
coming down to meet them at the point of their need. You see, the church today, I don't want to knock the church, I love the church, but most of the time in the church today, we'll see the need of people, we'll hear the cry of the need of people, we may even weep a few tears for those people because we'll show concern for those people, but coming down to them, to condescend to them, oh, well, somebody else must do that for me, and we don't come down. We do the first three, but we fail in the last four. God did not do that. He's never done that. He didn't do it with the children of Israel, with Moses. He never did it at the point of our salvation. He saw our need. He heard our cry. He was deeply concerned, and he came down, as Jesus did, to die upon a cross to take our salvation, to take our sin away and give us salvation. God came down. And then Jesus comes, and he tells us stories about people who did the same he tells us a story, you know, of the Good Samaritan. And the, the two religious leaders walk past the guy in the ditch. And they saw, and they heard his cry. And I'm sure they were concerned. I'm sure there was a measure of concern. But the tragedy is that they never went down into the gutter until the Samaritan came along. He heard, he saw, he was concerned. But he was different. He got down into the gutter with that man. He met him at the point of his need. And isn't that just what God did? And God tells us through this passage to do exactly the same. Those who choose to do this are going to have to live life differently. Those who choose to live with this mindset are going to have to, are going to, have to sort of choose the road less traveled. I love that terminology. To choose the road less travel. Because not many people travel this road to the depth of compassion that I'm talking to you about. Not many people do it. They go for the first three. They see they're here and they're concerned, but they don't go to the step four. And they, they don't, they, because that is the road less traveled. I don't do meet many people who live out this other one, the last one, to the end that I believe that God wants us to do. The road less traveled. You say, why not? Well, some people don't do it because they fear rejection. What are people going to say about me? If I suddenly become this person is, who does all these things, what, what's, what are my buddies next door going to say? What are the guys at work going to say? What are the ladies at the coffee group going to say if I suddenly become this type of a person? And we live in fear of public opinion. That's one thing. Some of us are fear of standing on people's toes. We've got the fear of rejection. But I don't think any of those things compares with the issue of momentum. You know, we're caught up in a race in life. We're caught up in a journey of life. And I'm trying to explain to the previous service, I didn't do a great job with it. But you know, in America, you have these huge highways, eight, six lanes, six lane highways. Freak out, man. Where do you get those things from? In Africa, you're lucky to get two lanes and they're full of potholes. You know, so, you know, but a six-lane highway. But here we are traveling along a six-lane highway. We know that we need to get off at a particular opportunity of an off-ramp. So we know an opportunity comes up. I know I'm going to have to get off the opportunity of an off-ramp. But man, it's difficult in peak traffic to get to the lane where I can take the off-ramp. So I get stuck in my lane. I get stuck and I can't move to the side where the off-ramp is so that I can take the opportunity of getting off the highway of life to be able to do what I'm calling you to do today. We get stuck in the momentum as it sweeps us through life. It's like a roller coaster. You can't get off once you're on. It's like a treadmill. It just You're treading away. It's like the rat race in life where you're running like heck, but you're making no progress at all. I think that keeps more people from fulfilling this commission than probably anything else. We are stuck in the lane. We're stuck in the momentum of a world that just sweeps us along and we're not traveling and walking along the path less traveled. People, this is an intentional journey to change lanes so that when you're in the lane with the, with the off with the off-ramp about to happen, you're ready for it. We need to walk ready to take every opportunity to do what we tell your story, to tell good news, and then to be good news. You've got to travel in the right lane. You may have to get out and out onto the road that is less traveled by most people. Does that make some kind of sense? I really hope so. Now, this road less traveled. 
On the road less traveled, everybody's into greatness. You know, the world wants you to be great. Well, God says greatness is overrated. You know what is better than greatness? Is goodness. It's goodness. We read books about good to great, as if great is the ultimate. Not at all. Jesus never tells anybody to be great. He just tells you to be good. He tells you to be, take good news, be good news, share good news. But, you know, those are the things that Jesus would want for us to be, is about being good, taking good, being the church, as your brochure at the back of the, says there. Go be the church. The church is a good entity. Just be good. And greatness is overrated. Psalm 23 does not say, greatness and mercy follow me all the days of my life. What does it say? Goodness. You don't get better than goodness. Greatness is thoroughly overrated. But the people driving on that six-lane highway, missing every off-ramp to show goodness, are all into greatness. Don't be fooled, people. Start talking to your kids a different language. It's talking to them about goodness and not greatness because that's of a higher value in the cause of the kingdom of Christ. At the end, you know, we find that goodness is good enough. Matthew 25, and the, the guys with the talents come in, and what, is, what does the, the king say? He says, well done, good and faithful servant. He even says, well done, great and faithful servant. He says, well done, good and faithful servants. So how do we do that? First thing, like we said, we've got to share good news. And the way you share good news is simply by telling your story. Let me illustrate this with a, with a beautiful example. Jesus one day crossed to the other side of the lake, and there was a demonic man there, just one demonic man who screamed all day long, cut himself with stones, was bleeding continually, and the people hid from him. They couldn't come close to him. He was a terrifying sight. And Jesus arrives, and he says to the demon-possessed man, your demons are about to leave you. He drives them into herds of pigs, and the man comes right in his mind. And he came to Jesus, so I said, oh, Jesus, that was the best thing that's ever happened to me. Jesus, that was, Jesus, can I be one of your disciples? Can I hang with you? Can I come with you where you go? And Jesus said, no, nah, no, you can't. What I want you to do, my man, is I want you to go back to where you came from. It's called the Decapolis 10 godless cities. And I want you to go back there. And the man would say, but Jesus, what am I going to do there? He says, I'll just tell your story. Just go and tell him your story. And so he does. And we read in one of the other gospels that later on, Jesus went to the Decapolis. He'd never been there before. No missionaries had been sent there. But when Jesus arrived in the Decapolis, there were thousands of people wanting to meet Jesus. How did they know anything about this? Where did those thousands of people come from? Let me tell you where it came from. One man, an ex-demon-possessed man, went into the town and he just told his story. And a result of his, as a result of his story, thousands of people came to meet Jesus. The power of your story, share it with others. It's good news to them. The second thing we have to do is we have to be good news. Got to be good news. I love in the, the book of Acts, there's a hero of this. His name is Barnabas. In Acts chapter 4, it declares of Barnabas, he was a good man. Wasn't a great man. Didn't say he achieved great things. He was just a good man. And then you trace the story of Barnabas. His name means sons of encouragement, son of encouragement. And he's the one who sold a property. He looked at the needs of the people in the community, the first century church. He says, man, guys, God has given this to me, but I'm giving it to God. I'm going to use this for what God has called me to do. He sells the land and he gives the money to the people so they can live better lives. He's declared good. Because he didn't just tell good news, he became good news to the people. They declared him to be a good man. Hey, imagine that, guys, being on your tombstone one day. Here lies Joe Bloggs, a good man. Don't get better than that. A good man. Not a great man. Not a man who did great things. No, no, just a good man. 
that is the value of the highest that you could possibly get. So those who win against the thing of selfishness have grasped those few things. The last thing they have to grasp is they have to grasp with, with a sense of urgency. I don't know if you've whew, been watching the news recently, and I've never been one who puts dates and times to the second coming of Jesus. You know, if you want to know that, you better ask Sean, you know, <laughs> I don't know when Jesus is going to come, but I know he is coming. And reading the signs and the times right now, guys, it's, it's pretty evident, hey? That the times could be rather close. So time could be running out for us. And I don't want you to be found to be wanting when Jesus comes. If he comes in our generation, you don't want to stand before God and say, Lord, if only I had done those things. And he's going to say, guys, it's just too late. You were so stuck on the highway of life. You couldn't get off it. You were stuck on the highway of trying to be great instead of just taking the off ramp to being good. And God will look at that and he's going to say, man, you just arrived too late. You know how much blessing is lost in life when you arrive late for something? I don't know if your church is anything like our, our church, but our church are people arrive late all the time. You know, it's the craziest thing. You know, we, we meant to start where church at, say, 9 o'clock. Quarter past 9, there's still people coming into the church. At 10 past 9, the church looks half empty. Kind of like this morning here. Just saying. <laughs> just, just, <laughs> Sean, we have the same problem, pal. <laughs> just, and there's nothing worse than being late. You could miss out on, on something. I just think, you know, the story we spoke just now about the, the Good Samaritan. If that was a real life story for Jesus, it was a parable. But it could be a really a, a typified in many people's lives. And those people who walk past the guy in the ditch, if they knew the outcome of the story, they would have thought, man, if only I'd gone back. If only I'd gone back. And you know what God would have said? Too late. I had to find somebody else to do it. You were too distracted. You were too passionate about some other thing. It's just too late. I had to find a Samaritan to do what I wanted you to do. You're just too late. People, you don't want to be found too late. So I hope you'll take this message from whence it has come. You know, this is a heartfelt thing about us seeing the needs of people, having our hearts broken by the needs of the people. Because a broken heart is something that is going to move you in a new direction, it's going to shape, it's, going to, it's probably going to trash your whole life. When God breaks your heart for the needs of people and the challenges around, you will never be the same again. I can remember standing at the bedside of a kid dying of HIV, a young man, the prime of his life, made a mistake, committed a sin, if you want to say, and now he's dying, and he's crying out to me, Trevor, help me, Trevor, I can't breathe, Trevor, do something, and I watched this guy die, and I'm thinking to myself, that should never be, that should never be, and I was angry, I was deeply upset, cried for a week, and I'm such a crybaby, I cry all the time, you know, and I, and I went for this kid. You know, it shouldn't be like that. Changed my entire life. My trajectory in life, my value system, everything changed at the point of that particular crisis. So I don't wish crisis on anyone unless that be the outcome that could possibly come from it. Those are the things that are going to cause us to share our story. Don't share it too late, people. People, you have in your hands what they need. And what you have in your hands does not belong to you. It belongs to God. Feel free to share it with others because he's got plenty more to share. Let's think about this for a moment and I'll close. You know, we, so far we've spoken about this intervention. And we've spoken about this road less traveled. We've spoken about goodness and greatness and all those things. And I just want to say again to you as a church in Vacaville, thanks for all your support. Thanks for hearing our cry, for seeing our need, for being concerned, and then in getting down into the ditch with us. Thanks for winning over indifference. That's a tough one. 
Thanks for telling your story in our place. Thanks for sharing your stuff with us. Thanks for just being good. Don't worry about greatness. God determines that. Right now, we just need to be good. Now, I address that comment to your church. That church is made up of people, you. And unless you embrace this philosophy of living, which is based upon a theology of God, you will never fulfill the mandate that I've been speaking about today. So my heart and my prayer is that you as individuals will embrace what I've been talking about here. Before I pray, I do have one last thing. See, I'm a preacher. You never believe a preacher when he says one last thing. <laughs> There's always one more. Well, I have one last thing, and this is the last thing. You know, the guys that got trampled at the gate is a sign of victory for us as believers. The guys that got trampled at the gate when all the good news was given, and they were trying to stop everybody, saying, no, 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 we're going to go have some kind of order over here. And they got, they were blown, they were knocked down, and they were trampled and killed at the gate. They were trampled underfoot. Let me tell you, this is a statement of great victory. You do know back in the Garden of Eden, it said of Satan that there will one day come a day when someone will come and crush his head, and you will bruise, and he will bruise your heel. Just like this. Satan's head gets crushed when you live this lifestyle. Satan's head is not crushed simply because Jesus died. That's wonderful. But when we claim that victory, we stand on his head and we say, I'm not going to be suckered into a way of life that is anything short of this. I'm going to tell my story. I'm going to share my stuff. And I'm going to stand on your head, Satan, and I will declare the victory at the end of the day. I really hope that be your experience. Thank you for listening to me. Let's pray. Father, today we, we're so aware of our need of you, but at the same time, we're so aware of, man, the responsibility that we have as believers. Every one of us as a believer has a story, but we need to protect ourselves from the sins of omission. The sins of commission have been dealt with. You have forgiven those. We have a clean slate with you. And now, Lord, as we look to the future, we're looking at the possibility of sins of omission. Oh, Lord, I really pray that we would be able to, to just be able to deal with these things, to be able to do the things that you've called us to do with a great attitude, not begrudgingly, but with joy and with celebration of your goodness toward us as we celebrate your goodness by simply telling the good news to those who need to hear it and being the good news as we share their pain. Thanks for this mission week. Pray it be a good one. In your name. Amen.